I am very pleased to welcome uh, Roberta Seeley, uh, who is a conservation technician for the Heritage Resource Management section of the City of Hamilton, who's going to talk about a very interesting project uh, that is kind of one thing, one option for reorg, which could be regrouping storage areas into one single one, and a very successful project, and I'm very pleased to have her with us today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Yeah. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Hamilton Civic Museums, um, the system contains um, eight sites now. Um, do, so Battlefield National Historic Site, Dunder National Historic Site, Fieldcoat Memorial Park and Museum, Griffin House National Historic Site, Hamilton and Scourge National Historic Site, Hamilton Children's Museum, Hamilton Military Museum, the Hamilton Museum of Steam and Technology, and Whitehearn Historic House and Garden. In addition to these eight sites, we are also the stewards of a civic, corporate, and public art collection, um, as well as housing collections uh, related to various historic buildings, which we are the caretakers of. Um, it's approximately 40 buildings in total, uh, with an artifact collection as catalog now of about 40,000 objects. Um, so the reorganization project really focuses on the five highlighted sites above. Um, Griffin House is a new site for us, so we haven't addressed issues related to storage around that yet. Um, Hamilton and Scourge is an underwater archaeological site. Uh, the Hamilton Children's Museum only has a couple of items in their collection. They're more of a hands-on museum. And the Hamilton Museum of Steam and Technology stores their items on site because they are very large and very bulky, and we won't let them in our new centralized storage. Uh, so the need for this project really began way before my time. Um, so in 19, the 1980s, in which time I was still playing with My Little Ponies at home, um, a series of curators identified um, some problems with storage on site, um, particularly related to the off-site storage of the military collection. Um, and when I first started, I found a series of scathing memos from 1988 and 1989 from uh, curator then Brenda Brownlee, who just, uh, referred to the military museum's storage space as being a filthy, humid, mouse-infested storage facility. If something isn't done in the very near future, there will be no collection to transfer to any new facility of any sort. 1989 should be the last year the military museum collection spends in that hellhole. Um, I would like to say that it is um, 2015, and as of this year, we will finally be out of that space. Uh, so, a long time coming. <clears throat> Um, in 1990, uh, Therese Charbonneau um, was hired as an external consultant to address some of the issues um, and make recommendations for the collection. Um, so multiple deficiencies were identified in her report, um, including lack of security in storage spaces, lack of environmental control, and severe overcrowding. But it wasn't until after amalgamation of the city in 2001 that we had the centralized resources to deal with the problem. Um, so when amalgamation happened, we had both the physical, financial, and the staff to deal with the problem and uh, plan to put it into place. So just to give you an overview of the problem. Uh, storage in historic house museums is often relegated to unrestored rooms of the house. Um, this frequently means attics, basements, and closets. Um, so this is storage from Dunder National Historic Site. The slide to your left is uh, storage in a room known by staff as the conservation room. There's nothing remotely related to conservation occurring in this space, and I keep pleading with them to stop calling it this. <laughs> um, attempts to organize the room in a logical fashion and provide some method of safe storage have been thwarted by lack of controlled access to this space, and it just keeps becoming a dumping ground for things because they won't put a lock on it that only certain people um, can get into. The space to the right is um, storage in the old silver vault. So while there's some level of security, it's severely overcrowded. They're using acidic boxes. Things are piled on each other. It's, it's terrible. It's terrible. <sighs> Uh, several storage spaces were created in Whitehurn National Historic Site. I mean, for some reason, they're all in unrestored bathrooms. I think in the one slide, you can see a <laughs> toilet and a sink. Um, 
attempts have been made to improve the storage con uh, conditions in these spaces. However, they're insufficient to house the auxiliary collection of the uh, house, and there's a lack of controlled access, once again, that leads to clutter and interpreters pawing through things to do research. Uh, this is the archival space. Um, you can't see it in this one, but under those rolled tubes there, there's a bathtub. It's another bathroom. <laughs> um, Attempts have been made to improve storage conditions, but one, once again, it's insufficient to house the auxiliary collection. Uh, this is the three, this house, three generations of the McQuesten family lived here, and we have all of their belongings uh, that were left to the city, um, and in my opinion, they were hoarders. Um, so um, when people were uh, confessing to having uh, items stored in furniture, every piece of furniture in this house has something shoved in it. Field Coat Memorial Park and Museum. It stores its collection in the two places most feared by conservators, and myself being a conservator, it gives me the willies, um, the attic and the basement. Um, issues abound with these storage spaces, including poor environmental control. The basement storage area is an auxiliary building that um, has no uh, environmental control whatsoever, and the wiring in the building was done by volunteers, so I'm pretty sure it's going to burn down at some point. Um, and there's severe overcrowding. Um, Well-meaning volunteers trying to save the history of Ancaster continually add things to the collection here. So, um, and the fan shell storage to your right became a health and safety issue. I was worried about furniture tumbling down on me every time I went in there. The military museum, as mentioned before, we have had well-meaning groups of people do the best they can with the space, but the environmental conditions are terrible. It's not our building, we rent the space, and it's located within a large warehouse uh, used by Parks and Recreation, so they bring in their vehicles and idle them within the space. There's inadequate environmental controls, there's ongoing high relative humidity issues, and even with dehumidifiers, we keep getting mold issues in the space. Um, in addition to this, we had a large clothes moth infestation in the space, and uh, on going rodent issues and when they tore the ream building across the uh, uh, street down we started getting uh, oriental cockroaches on the traps. So the city once again <laughs> wasn't going to give us millions of dollars for a purpose-built storage building and they wouldn't give us money to buy anything, so we inherited this. Um, so it looks like an abandoned building. It was a really great cloaking device for a while because people just kind of left it alone, um, and we had to make the best of it. So it's a 23,000 square foot building, um, and as I said, we did inherit it. The floor plan shows the original layout of the building. Um, so we've got uh, one large room, this the pointer. So these areas here were caged off. We have a brick building in the back for art storage, a separate um, storage here. Um, it says Dundurn, but it was actually Whitehorn. And we had a little room here that we turned into an isolation room. Uh, this is the building uh, when we inherited it, and so there was a lot of cleaning to do. Um, and once again, this is, I remember seeing this in 2006 when I was doing my internship. Um, by the time I joined the city on contract, this is what it looked like. <laughs> so early storage in the building was by uh, collection type rather than by material. Um, the shelving was fixed and individual collection areas were caged off to segregate them. Uh, we didn't have collections management software at that time and we didn't have centralized um, collections management conservation and all of that kind of thing. Uh, more early shots from inside the building. Uh, this is Battlefield House Nash Jackson storage. Um, field coat storage. And we had uh, rolling shelves um, for art storage, or sorry, not rolling shelves, pull out sh shelves. So with this building, and uh, I was hired to do a, a project, a rehousing project, we identified some problems. Um, and uh, those being environmental issues around the site. I think I dropped half my presentation there. Um, during this time also museum resources were being centralized. So um, this is what really moved this uh, project forward. So a registrar collections management position was created for all of the sites and we got collections management software to actually track the collections. Um, and at this time we started actually cataloging things and inputting things so we knew what we had. 
a conservation technician was hired, that was me, um, to deliver the preventive conservation program for all the sites. And heritage facilities maintenance was also centralized at this time. So having the dedicated resources to deal with these issues, um, several deficiencies with the building were noted. So we had environmental control issues. So heating in the winter was with overhead rad, so it was uneven and it was cooking the artifacts that were up high. And we had no environmental the summer, so um, we ended up with high uh, relative humidity levels within the building. Um, pollutants were an issue. Um, the roof of the building was flat tar and uh, wood slats, and so we had particles of tar raining down on the collections. So we had covered the tops of the shelving units with polyethylene to help protect them, but we still couldn't keep the building clean, um, and so housekeeping was an issue. And there were building envelope issues. So there were cracks in the envelope of the building, some of them which I could see daylight through, which led to ongoing pest issues. So when we were doing the rehousing project, we identified a carpet beetle infestation that we had to deal with within the site. But having um, centralized facilities, we identified some resources to start addressing these issues. So the next phase of the project was retrofitting the building to make it a space that the museums would actually want to store their artifacts in. Um, so it included the installation of a proper forced air HVAC system, roof repair, the installation of a drop ceiling and uh, to stop the tar particles from raining down, and repairs to the building envelopes um, to seal up the cracks, and we sealed up windows and such. So here you can see the ductworks going in, installation of the drop ceiling, which improved the brightness and we got new lights. There's more, and some repairs and cosmetics to the outside of the building. Um, so now it kind of looks like a Bath and Body Works from uh, the suburbs, but um, <laughs> Uh, the, neighbor, the neighbors were getting kind of suspicious of us. They thought we were running, a, we, when we put an HVAC system on the side, they thought we were running a grow up. So um, <laughs> we put a city of Hamilton sign on the edge of the building. Um, so the downside to this project is that when they started to do this, they never identified a budget for moving um, the artifacts out of the building. So everything had to be protected while the workers were doing the um, HVAC project. Um, it wasn't the ideal uh, situation um, and really uh, to be discussed and kind of lessons learned. Make sure when your facilities are planning that they realize that having artifacts in the building, not, not necessarily the best. So once we had this space done, we realized that uh, we had maximized the space um, with um, the uh, static shelving. So um, with the help of the collections uh, manager and the facility supervisor, we secured funds for a large project to have high density shelving installed so that we could effectively increase storage space within the building, um, doub doubling the storage space. Um, once again, nobody identified funds for packing and moving of the artifacts. So in order to make this happen, I had to help pack all of the artifacts with a team of uh, collections catalogers who I trained to pack the items. Um, we worked very hard over a four to five month period to pack everything. Um, here's Lydia Amos making boxes. The other thing was we couldn't have full archival materials or museum quality materials for everything because it wasn't in the budget. So where we could, we had uh, archival materials in direct contact with the um, items and acidic boxes on the outside. Um, this is the team at Christmas. We were going a little bit batty by then, so as I said, this was a team effort, um, and thanks to the people who kept me sane through this. But by Christmas time, um, everything was ready to move. A fine art mover moved it out of the building and stored it for the duration of the project. So here is everything with the cages taken down to make best room of the high density shelving that was going to be installed. So this is the new floor plan. So we have two runs of high density shelving that were going to be installed. Uh, we had to cut in some new doors, so a new door to the Dundurn storage area because um, we had to block the old one in order to make best use of the space, um, and a new fire door. But what we ended up with after all of the stress, <sighs> sexy shelving as I like to call it. Um, my boss keeps telling me to stop that and I need to get out more. <laughs> Um, so this is the shelving before we cluttered it up with the collection again. <laughs> uh, so as you see, uh, so we have a facility that looks like proper museum storage now. So 
Now the collections are organized by material type where possible. So we have on the left, uh, large furniture storage. On the right, we have box textiles. We have specialized storage for rolled textiles and uh, framed works. Um, and boxed storage, um, we haven't unpacked yet. I haven't gotten to that point, but this is the small to medium sized um, artifact storage and uh, we will be, uh, uh, it's arranged according to material type. So just a couple of lessons that I learned while this project was going on. Teamwork and communication are really essential. There were some hiccups that happened because we weren't communicating. So if facilities had known that you know it's expensive to move stuff, they may have put that in the budget. And identify the resources for the project you want to do. Uh, facilities after the fact had told us we could have done this all in one run, the HVAC retrofit and the high density. So we could have moved everything out at one time and uh, wouldn't have had that uh, experience of trying to keep things safe while we had contractors in the building. Um, also, organized storage isn't just about the building and the collections housed in the building. It is really about the people and having a management plan. Um, without having a centralized collections manager, or conservation technician, and facilities, we would have just ended up with another building where the museums would uh, just pile everything. So now there's controlled access. We did rekey the building um, when we, which the, the curators aren't necessarily thrilled about, um, but they understand that um, because the collections are mixed, it's really important to track things now, or we're going to lose things. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions for Roberta? No? Oh, okay. Yes. Um, hi, I was just wondering how much room you have to grow. <laughs> There would be a difference of opinion between myself and the collections manager on this one. As it stands, the space now will help us deal with the existing issues. Right now, I'm working on packing military storage and integrating it into that collection. It's still, um, we haven't integrated Whitehern, which really does need to be addressed. Um, I, I think we have to come up really with a compromise on that. And we're also going to be taking on, we are taking on a deaccessioning campaign because when we packed things, we realized with the curators that there were a lot of items in here that you know either didn't relate to the mandate or the time period or were broken or irreparable, um, didn't have any kind of provenance. Um, so there's some purging that will go on. So as I said, the collections manager and I have to have a bit of a compromise in there. There is some room for some growth, but I telling the curators, don't think you can go crazy now. Um, <laughs> this is kind of our temporary fix, and we do hope to get acquire another building at some point, but we know we're not going to get that kind of centralized curatorial dream center, so we're making the best of this, and we're hoping to balance easing some of the conservation issues with allowing the curators to have some new stuff. <laughs> question. Um, did everything pretty much fit in compact shelving and art racks or did you have to find some custom solutions for specific <laughs> Okay, so that's a good question. So the old Dundurn room um, that we cut new doors into is going to become the large oversized artifact storage for things that won't fit on the shelf. So we do have things that we have a World War I art, horse-drawn artillery gun, won't fit on a shelf. So, and actually we had to have custom doors made for that because it was about three inches bigger than the standard doors. So anything that requires specialized um, storage will go within that space rather than on the shelves. Great. Well, thank you very much, Roberta. Thank you. Thank you.